Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. It's lovely to have you back here. Ah, uh, uh, man, there's so many new flus out there. I don't know which one I've got, but I read one recently called the tomato flu. Uh, exactly. I don't know. Monkeypox for sure not. I haven't really been doing my rounds if uh, that's where you get it from. But I sometimes think if you celebrate someone too much as well, it's a problem, right? Uh, I think everyone needs to be sort of handled in moderation, including yourself. If you big up yourself too much, it's a problem. If you think you're the, sh if, 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 you, if you think of yourself in too many shitty ways, it's not good. And the middle ground, like, oh, you're good enough, but you're a piece of shit. That's kind of where you need to be at life, to be at peace in life, not be at life, but be in life at peace or be at peace in life, whichever suits you. But I feel the problem when someone keeps celebrating a particular role whether it's parent whether it's mother father whether it's you know caregiver what tends to happen then is you become this piece of shit who thinks that everyone else around you is doing nothing or everyone else around you needs to take shit from you because you're the one who are this martyr who's sacrificing all your time for this role and you kind of forget you know perspective i suppose on what reality is that there are other people doing the same and you're kind of not isolated or not exclusive in your celebration or people putting up on this fucking pedestal thinking that oh my god she's so amazing she's done this yeah is this coming from somewhere i suppose so but i don't want to really pinpoint where this irritation is coming from but i'm just trying to broaden it so you might understand in your context and someone in your life who's pissing you off for this particular reason and i suppose you know of course salute the person, the people who do this. But sometimes I feel you need to get a step back, take a step back, get some idea of the larger picture. Because yeah, it's so easy to kind of get involved and then surround yourself in this echo chamber where everyone's just like, wow, you're doing such an amazing job. And you're just like, oh, but it's so hard. And then it just kind of repeats itself. And next thing you know, like in anything, I don't even think it's a particular thing. It's all aspects, right? In your job, in your um, hobby, in your passion, in whatever you do. So it's good sometimes to take a breath of fresh air and smell the roses, baby. Uh, yeah, th I think that's why having uh, a cigarette break is important. I, I don't smoke. I wish I did sometimes, uh, especially, you know, when you have a cold glass of beer or drink. It's just like, oh, it's more the association than the actual pull of the drug. But I feel that's what helps you. Uh, recalibrate if you want to call it like you're sitting in your room and you're just like oh I'm the shit and then you go have a cigarette you're like yeah you're not the shit but you feel like shit so do that once in a while you have your cigarette break in whatever way or form whether it's a cigarette or it's just a metaphor for a break where you can recollect recalibrate and reassess what you are and what um, where you are and what kind of importance and balance you need to give yeah yeah, because, you know, it's a strange thing. We, we kind of are given a certain number of things that are truly ours, right? When we when I say truly ours, I think it's the mind and body. It, we're born with it. We're born with these organs. We're born with these muscles. We're born with this organism. Or through this organism, we experience this human life or this human experience called life. And the things that we use are our senses. And of course, there's so many complex things within the body, but just make it easier for this podcast. Uh, the body and the mind. Now, the entire system, which is so-called our civilized society, tells us from day one that, you know, the body and the mind, you put food into the body, you put thoughts into the mind, and we have all these influences through language, communication, writing, reading, music, art, expression, all these things, which are great. I think uh, it's the pinnacle of social and human achievement in some ways, but it's pretty shitty in some other ways because you're always kind of looking at how, I mean, yeah, these are great expressions of emotion, all these, all these things I just mentioned, but you need to figure out what the fuck your emotions are in the first place. You need to figure out what do you want to say before how you're going to say it? Yeah. No point going and blabbering like a fool, which most of us do, because we're constantly trying to fit into this grid that is 
that contains all these tools, these expressions, and we try to fit into this grid without understanding what we're entering the grid with, with this idea um, of who you are or what you are in this life. Um, of course, it changes as you get older, but the most fundamental thing is that you have this mind, you have this body, and the first thing you gotta do is take care of that shit. You gotta understand what you put into it, like in your thoughts, you gotta put in some semblance of balanced thoughts, some semblance of balanced food, some semblance of balanced activity, some exercise. Instead of that, we go straight into this fucking thing of just pack them into the school system, pack them into the race, that's life or so-called life in their perspective. And then you have to do these things. You have to, as a kid, you have all these books to read, these games to play, these kids to get to know, to civilize yourself, to understand language, to speak to your parents, all these things that others have told and others have done before you. Then as you get a little older, you have to go to school, you have to make friends, you have to be the good kid who everyone likes. The teachers give a pat on the back, a gold star on the bum, whichever school you go to, I think you have a gold star on your bum. You probably should leave there sooner than later. And as you get a little older, as a teenager, you have to do all the things that teenagers do. You have to go through the things that the body puts you through. But even then, of course, the body is making you have all these hormonal things. Then you get into a little older and then you have all these fucking things. You have issues uh, which are deeper. You have issues which are more socially accepted or unaccepted, right? My point is this thing keeps, keeps continuing. And before you know it, you're 25 years old or 30 years old or 50 years old. And you have no fucking clue what your mind and body are because it's constantly being catering to some other person's narrative and some other person's standard of what it should be and what it should sound like, what it should look like, what it should feel like, what you should think like, what you should understand the world like. And all these filters aren't yours because you haven't really had time to look within. And I don't mean look within in a very profound, spiritual, mindful way. That helps, of course. But even before that, why do you think in a certain way? Why are these thoughts coming to your mind? And why are these things that we are supposed to do being done? And of course, why is the body reacting in a certain way? We work out because it's the right thing to do. We exercise every day because that's what's going to help us live longer, look fit, be accepted and not be someone who's standing out or unhealthy in all these terms or words or something that someone else has told you. But if you actually listen to your mind, if you actually listen to your body from a young age and you start saying, you know, this is something which hard, of course, but I'm going to start putting a little bit more positive thoughts into my head. I'm going to think a little bit in this way, even though it might not be the most lucrative or the most accepted way. This is what my body wants. This is what my mind wants. Next thing you know, you're entering the entire grid because you have, suppose you have to enter the grid. At some point, you're entering it with a very different approach. I would say you're in a little bit more of a balanced approach and you're not going to get overwhelmed and you're not going to get underwhelmed. You're not going to get over kind of run by the entire thing that's being fed into you, which is being force fed in many ways and which is kind of constantly being expected for you to perform and understand um, yourself better when you are doing the things that you're meant to do. And you sooner find a semblance of enjoying this human experience through the tools that are truly yours, which is your mind and your body. And yes, people will, uh, can in some ha harsh, hostile takeover do that where they come and take your mind and body. And that's for the most part illegal. But I'm saying when you're 30 and you go to a therapist, of course they help and psychiatrists help, but you can do it yourself at a younger age if you kind of just understand that this is your true tools to enjoy this human experience. The true and only your tools. Um, and sadly, we are giving that up to the larger narrative without even knowing. And as parents, we should tell our kids, this is your gift and this is your chance. And I, as a parent or as an parent, as an adult, I will give you my uh, guidance. I will give you some of the things that I've done, but instead of that, we force feed what we couldn't do. We force feed our insecurities. We kind of put our expectations. We kind of put these underlying pressures on these kids thinking that we're doing a good job, but we're actually fucking it up because man, it's the true thing that uh, a child is born with, which is a mind that is open, a body that can, can, can have true potential within, of course, its genetic structure and the genetic epigenome or whatever they call it to understand the messaging. But we so quickly confine it into our own mold and we make it into this thing that we think is the right thing we're doing, but it's really not. And then it's sort of compounded. It starts at home, then it goes to your next next level, next year, a family, then the friend circle, then the school system, then it becomes the larger system. And next thing you know, you have some issues and you have to go to a therapist who brings up all these things. As a kid, how was bad? Was it like, dude, we, it's so easy to remember the bad shit as a kid. But, or as an adult or as an adolescent, but it's sometimes so hard to remember the good shit. So remember the good shit, but more importantly, 
if you're in this place where you're able to understand the tools that you're born into this world with, which is the mind and the body, and you can truly understand what your mind and body need and what they can do for you and focus on that as opposed to what it can't do and how you're not as good as someone else, how you're not fitting in because someone else told you you're not fitting in or this is the norm of coolness, this is the norm of intelligence, of success. If you can appreciate what you can do, you won't be at, at you, uh, this is the final line I have to deliver with, with some gravitas, but clearly I'm fucking it up. If you understand what your body and mind are capable of and what uh, they enjoy and what you enjoy using them for, you aren't at the mercy of these various elements that end up fucking most of us because we feel that we fall short, that we're not good enough, that we're not as good as. So all these things I think are less relevant when you enter and live life and kind of appreciate life from this this vantage point. Vantage point, vantage point. Yeah, I don't know if that made any sense, but I needed to get it off my chest. And because I'm just dealing with this whole perspective issue, right? Because someone will say something that upsets you and they walk away. And then you're like, that piece of shit, how could you talk to me like that? But you got to think about it. The only person affected that moment is you. That person probably goes and says the same shit to 10 other people and they take it in a much better way or they might not even get affected by it. They might celebrate this person going, oh, this person is hilarious. This person is so profound. This person is so confident. But actually, you're the one getting affected by it. So that's why I was thinking about this. Your mind and body, it's truly something that you can, and not even command how they say, command your mind, mind over matter. Fuck, okay, if you can do that, good for you. Some people are strong enough. Some people might just need to befriend the mind and body. If you have a certain relationship that is a friendly relationship with your mind and body, I think that's a great start. So I'm going to leave you with that because I don't want to sound like a nut job. At the same time, I would like you to also listen to the conversation coming up with my fantastic friend and guest, Sudha Menon. She's an author and journalist. She's written, I think, six books. The most recent one, I think it's coming out. Or it's already out. It's called Recipe for Life, where she talks to people about their favorite recipes, whether it's from their mother or their father or their grandmother or grandfather, from their wife, their sister, their husband, whoever the influence or that dish is, and it's captured as a story and a recipe. It's, of course, um, her newest book. And the reason Sudha and I met was many years ago, she wrote a book called Gifted, um, where she covers stories about people who are living with a disability and how they overcome adversity. And I happen to be one of them. I think she was running short of chapters. I think that's why she needed to find me. <laughs> but we got along. Had a lovely chat back in 2013 and we've been friends ever since and i got on this con on this episode to talk about um yeah what what sort of shapes her writing style but what we kind of talk about is this idea of growing up the idea of growing old idea of meeting people across various walks of life people with various perspectives uh people who have different success stories people who have different um experiences with rejection and overcoming obstacles and adversity. But more importantly, we talk about those few traits that Sudha has noticed amongst all the people she's covered in her various books, from children of uh, business leaders to children of, um, you know, parents who have people who do, parents who don't have, to people who have disabilities, to people who are in the limelight, people whose lives haven't gone as well. But few traits that are the traits that kind of celebrate the human spirit in some sense, but also help us get by life. And we don't have to always celebrate. Sometimes you just want to live. And living in itself is a true celebration that a lot of people don't uh, consider as a celebration. So it's a fun conversation. It's a very nice conversation with a lovely woman and a very strong and admirable human being so enjoy your conversation with Sudha Menon coming up on the other side uh, of course stay in touch with me you can write in at show at gmail.com if you have anything to share uh, yeah as always I appreciate you for tuning into this podcast every week a new episode comes up and it comes on your phone and you can click and you'll be blown not blown blown away don't be blown by my podcast how weird would that be but anyway I'd like to thank you as always uh, this is the Soapy Rao Show I'm Sandeep Proud. thank you for tuning in and here's your conversation or here's the conversation for you with Sudha Menon on the other side till next time goodbye God bless take care of yourselves take care of that body take care of that mind cheers
Sudha Menon, how are you doing? And it's lovely to have you on the podcast. It's always a pleasure to be talking to you, uh, Sandeep. And I, fe I feel like uh, we've known each other so long, but we haven't actually sat down and have a, you know, had a conversation uh, about stuff. We yeah, you know, the strange thing is the first time we met, we had a lengthy chat that was at uh, this, which hotel was that? The Phoenix Hotel in Pune when you were interviewing me <laughs> for uh, Gifted. And yes. I was just getting me ready for the show. And then you called and said, can can I, can I we do a chat? And it ended up being like a one hour chat in their restaurant. And it was pretty interesting because it was quite a an in-depth conversation. Like it, it, yes. I had just met you. You told me the premise uh, of how you got in touch with me and why you got in touch with me. And then I kind of just sort of just poured my heart out. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> then I looked back going, is that safe to do? <laughs> But of course, no, with you, I, it was safe to do so. Yeah, I I think that was um, eleven years ago, Sandeep. Uh, two thousand thirteen. It's amazing how. Yeah, two thousand thirteen. Yeah. I think yeah, nine oh eleven. No, I think two thousand thirteen because that's when I came out not of the closet, but came out with that show <laughs> out of sight, and I was in Pune, and uh, I think you saw the article or you, you saw the show name. I think that's how yes. you got in touch yes. with me. Wow. And I remember being very, very intrigued by the name. And I said, you know, I have to, I have to catch this guy and see what, especially because I was writing uh, Gifted uh, at that point. Yeah. And um, I said, I must get him. And I still remember I was waiting for you in the hotel, uh, I think in the lobby. And yeah, yeah. Um, I kept, I kept looking at the door and I was, and this is, this is the worst kind of stereotype. And after meeting yeah. you, I forever changed, uh, you know, how I looked at people with, uh, uh, you know, who were, uh, no, I don't. I don't even know any any more whether I should say disability because then mm. differently able, but uh, yeah. people who have a disability say no. But I am disabled. Like you, yeah. it's okay. You can say that. Yeah. So I'm forever trying to you know um, tiptoe around these words. But I yeah. I was expecting somebody who looked blind, and I mm. and this is this is how we grow up, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That I think it's a lot of things about how we see. How is a person uh, who's visually impaired shown in a movie? Like he'll mm. always have a cane and he'll have dark glasses and he'll yeah. look very insecure. And I remember you coming in, uh, you know, striding like some suave actor and uh, walking <laughs> past, past me. Overconfidence, I, yeah. <laughs> I just walked right past the person I'm supposed to meet. <laughs> yeah. And then um, I went up to the lobby, I think, and I, uh, you know, up to the reception and said, I'm waiting for this person. So he said, oh, he's sitting there. And I said, and I looked and I saw you and, you know, I said, Are, he just came in and I, he walked past me. And, mm. you know, so that taught me that if you have, if you are differently abled or if you have some kind of impairment, you don't necessarily wear it on your sleeve, isn't it? Yeah. So, so writing gifted, meeting you in many ways changed the way I look at the world. I was, you know, I want to come to that because you've done so many different projects on uh, issues like this and other issues. But I want to also talk about this idea that we are, um, you know, that year was the year I actually decided to talk about my eye condition on stage more for my kind of peace of mind than yeah. any kind of celebration or recognition. Uh, because easily you get caught up, caught up in the label, right? And then that takes you in a very different journey. And in many yeah. ways, it might be rewarding for some people. And I totally uh, appreciate where they come from. But it's also in my sense, I found I, I find the label of constantly just sort of waving that flag disability or um, yeah. activist or advocate. I think there are a lot of people doing good work in the space, but that I found it stifling. So I didn't want to automatically sort of be bracketed as a blind comedian or a blind yeah. performer yeah. or entertainer because, yeah. um, you know, it so happened that as the, the, the show the show out of sight happened then um, I started including more stories and my experiences as a visually impaired person because that's sort of what I lived through in yeah. my material uh, but trying to make a conscious effort of being funny uh, more importantly not just sort of going down this inspirational path which yeah. it, frankly speaking I think is good but at the same time again is quite stifling and boring after a point and my job is to be funny and I enjoy being funny mm -hmm. but this thing you mentioned of not wearing the label and we wearing the sort of the, the 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 avatar if you want to call it or the yeah. uh, disability on your on your sleeve the problem I feel now is that if you you know I, I walk around with a cane and I need glasses because the glare is too bright is 
you do it because it's also from safety and from a physical point that your eyes do need protection. Yeah. But it's almost like it's come back full circle, right? I kind of avoided that 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 look of a visually impaired person, yeah. not because I was avoiding it, but at the same time, I didn't need a cane. But yeah. I was also kind of embarrassed to use a cane. So there's, I was mm-hmm. shying away from the stereotype, but at the same time, the stereotype kind of followed me and I'm now doing yeah. it more from a safety. So it's kind of weird. But yeah. um, you, you, you know, obviously you wrote... Uh, gifted and of course that book has done fantastically well in various uh, things think, right it's it's yeah. it's shown people yeah the, the story you know something yeah. at that point at that mm. point 13 years ago i think no 2013 yeah. so i think nine yeah. years uh, yeah. uh, ago that book was needed because i yeah. think uh, i think the discussion around inclusion the discussion around uh, you know people who are differently able people who are not like the rest of, uh, you know, the, somebody said, oh, she's normally abled. And I love that. You know, I love yeah, that. Okay, yeah. you want to call me differently able, so I'm going to call you normally able. I yeah. love that thing. So yeah. what I need to say is that at that point, nine years ago, there was not so much, so not so much discussion about inclusion. And yeah. it was always as if we are trying to put uh, uh, people who have different abilities or who are not like the normal, who are, who have disability on the fringes of your life. And I noticed that and I said, and I also came in touch with Firoz, as you know, and my dear, dear friend Firoz, yeah. uh, we are Firoz, who's, you know, a former MD of uh, SAP and uh, a very, very, the person who started the India Inclusion Summit. I came, yeah. I came, um, I, I met him, uh, I think that was serendipity and I had, I had invited him to launch my book Legacy in Bangalore. Mm-hmm. And at the end of it, he asked me, look, this is a fantastic book. And so, can we co-author a book on you know the lives of people with disability and that's how gifted came about and it was it was relevant at that point and i think uh, you know to call it uh, it was important at that point to call it the inspirational stories of people with uh, disability because we all tend to think that if you have a disability then your life is over and you're no worth nothing and I wanted to show the people who are doing so much more. You know, when I met all of you, all the people that I've featured in that book, uh, I came away from it thinking that I'm you. I'm living life only ten percent, mm-hmm. while the person with disability in that book live in life. You know, really seventy mm, like three hundred percent, and and uh, and taking it in a stride. Like for, like you said that I I avoided using a cane because I was embarrassed. But eventually, it kind of uh, you know catches up with you but uh, you're leading your life like anybody else and you don't want to wear your disability on your sleeve. yeah and you know that's a strange thing that has happened right you kind of avoid these things because you want to you want to be normal but at the same time uh what is normal right uh you yeah. kind of want to hide your weakness or the perceived weakness that society paints um as a disability or as a vulnerability and uh, if you actually look at it everyone's got one um, so I want to actually of talk course. to you about that because, y- yes, absolutely, you know, the words inspiration, the words me too, all these are very timely things that need to address a much more profound issue in society. Yes. But as a result of the initial intention, which is good, the people and a lot of the fringes, uh, or people without maybe the right, with the right intention, but maybe the wrong approach, kind of run with it and it takes away from the main cause. And that's where I find now anything is inspirational, right? You want to play any card, it's an inspirational card as long as you can't question it. And it's amazing what you mentioned about how that discussion is required because yes, it did start a larger movement which has picked up momentum. It's given a lot of strength to people to voice their their reservations, to voice their insecurities and frankly speaking, to voice uh, their strengths as well. Uh, Mm. You know, while I no longer uh, am shying away from being seen as someone who can't see, I'm also focusing on a lot more of what I can do and not just yeah, being the, the victim so Telling of, your story your way, you know. Telling yeah, live your my story, story, telling my story. And it's amazing that the the the, the, the strength in discussion and the strength in, in, in dissemination of these 
these these contexts and the people are different and i think that message is constantly uh, is important to spread and you know just to sort of what you said uh, about 9 years back and how it's important when i did that show i was so scared to come out and say it on stage because people didn't believe me right because there's this idea that you have to look a certain part as a blind person <laughs> yes. and i was half the time i mean till date and not as much but earlier people are like that part you do about you not being able to see it's very good i'm like it's it's not it's not like i it's a it's an act right and uh the questions you kind of have to feel the 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 curiosity it all i suppose comes from maybe ignorance but even uh for instance if i have to travel for a gig say i'm coming to pune and there's an event manager for a corporate i'm like uh i need i wouldn't ask for assistance because i'm i was scared that i lose the gig right they're like who's this blind guy coming and asking uh for assistance i mean can he even perform if he can't see that was sort of yeah. the state yeah. uh, of how people looked at it but you know as recent as 3 4 days back i did a gig and i said you know i i was i, I didn't do i, I wasn't uh, performing um, a, a comedy routine i was doing more of a hosting role and it was obviously a big company and i said you know i i, I don't know if i can do the quiz because if someone in the audience is answering the question i don't know look the wrong way they're like no we're going to get send a volunteer on stage with you so the, all his job is to point out the right person or okay. for instance we have steps you can do so which is it's such a big leap right that yeah. from not being able to ask for assistance to they are like yeah absolutely yes. don't worry about your because your physical yes. safety your assistance your accommodations are priority for us so you don't lose gigs or you don't lose work as a result of what you are and I want to understand from someone like you who's quite immersed in it and the book has obviously gone from English to multiple languages uh nine and, nine languages and brilliant. and that's why I said it was a yeah. timely book you know yeah. it was it was timely and it was written with the right intent yeah yeah you know when I look back I often wonder whether you know why it happened because what I was writing before that or what I have done before you know to sub 24 years of journalism business mm. journalism so it was wow. business journalism is not really considered journalism with a heart you know but still that's uh, a lot of time that you spent uh, yeah of course it had a certain uh, agenda to it which is the business reporting aspect but yes. it's still a long even time then, yeah. you know what what i what i always like to say that if you do whatever it is you're doing with the right intent it yeah. always makes a difference yeah, so i yeah. was a business reporter but for the longest time in the beginning when it was really important um when india's labor movement was strong yeah um, i reported on labor issues i i reported on what the employee force was being subject to i mm. reported about exploitation of uh, mm. you know uh, laborers of workers and i reported about minorities i reported about women which is also a minority you know often yeah. treated like a uh, minority yeah. so we are not we are half the half this uh, country yeah. but so i did all of that so what i would say is whatever place you are in you can use that place uh to effect mm. if you have the right attitude you know you everything yeah. you do can be effective your 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 heart has to be in the right place and so after journalism um, you know after 24 years of journalism i woke up one day and i said this cannot be you know this alone can't define me this can't be my journey i was i was writing news stories uh sleep walking through it yeah, you know yeah, it had yeah. become so automatic that process so i said no my my heart is not in this anymore and i want to use my years on this earth and also as a journalist uh, i want to do something more permanent with it and so i said i'm going to become an author and you know what they say about a newspaper you know to you know today's newspaper is tomorrow's uh, raddi that's the kindest thing but you know to but uh, no i love newspapers not, because you know especially when my dog was a puppy like it came in so handy just like <laughs> no, no, <laughs> just <laughs> yeah so but, so i yeah. decided you know i i i grew up in a house where reading books was like religion that was our mm. religion i was yeah. i was brought up by a father who was a staunch leftist yeah. who was a great humanitarian and he said that books can change the world if there is mm. anything that can change the world it is books yeah. and so i said i'm going to be from now on like this day on i'm going to be a writer i'm going to put books into the universe that will have some impact on the people that i'm writing it for and um, yeah so 2010 i wrote my first book and um, i decided to write about women because i had, you know uh, it is called leading ladies women who inspire india and truly i needed i needed to write that book because mm. 
my years in journalism had brought me in touch with all this you know pioneering women women who were trend setters change makers also timely right you needed a book like just as you mentioned now very, very, you, you know now there that. are hundreds of books written in the same genre everybody wants yeah. to write about inspirational women but yeah, at yeah. that point sandeep there was nothing you know as a young woman a very ambitious young woman mm. uh, journalist there was nobody for me to look up to and learn from yeah and everything i learned was through huge struggles and i i was a journalist at a point in time where there were hardly any jo- women journalists maybe bombay yeah. had a few but yeah. you know uh, uh, second tier cities or uh, tier 2 cities and uh, uh, they didn't have women journalists even if there were women journalists they were on the desk not on the ground reporting so i came from yeah. i come from that time you know so the early 90s and yeah, yeah. so it was important for me to write a story because these women and and the women in that book leading ladies was everybody from uh, from uh, seva founder ila bhat who's one of the most most brilliant empathetic compassionate leaders i've ever met you know yeah. uh, globally globally acknowledged for her brilliance and for her body of work so yeah. the book features everybody from her to pt usha to naina lal kidwai you know the yeah. former chairperson of uh, uh, hsbc in india yeah. the first woman to go to harvard business school uh, mm. from india so all of them and i mapped their stories i tracked their trajectories i wanted to bring those stories to other women like me so that we could learn and say it is possible to make a life that you want these are the things that yeah. these women did and maybe we can follow them I, I, you know, there are a couple of things that sort of stand out as you mention what you uh, have, th- and maybe we can talk about it over the course of the conversation. But for instance, now I think one thing I want to address is like you mentioned this timeliness of a certain topic that needs to be addressed in the form of a book. In your case, right? Yeah. Whether it's the women, um, the leading ladies, um, and then of course with legacy, that's I think letters of parents to children. Yes. And say gifted. Maybe if we take these three books. there are certain issues which are underlying themes that appear to be common from my from my outside perspective in right mm. and and i want to understand like from then 2010 11 12 13 that's say the next 10 years we're sitting here 2022 the conversation looks very different with a lot of uh with say the me too happening the movement mm-hmm. the uh pandemic and then of course now with technology social media you have various forums for people to express uh their grievances the mm-hmm. ju- social justice all these various things that have taken um where the past decade has really sort of given it a boost yeah what if and since you've been quite immersed in it with ri- writing your book you had a sense of what it was and now you're living in a time of what it is uh what what if what is your uh thing of opinion on how things have changed and um maybe the positives maybe the negatives and just a general sense of where we are from where we uh, came you know sandeep i i am not sure much has changed in the way things are happening at various mm. levels if i was talking about women and you know how their equation stands how their status stands in society or at the workplace yeah. i'm not sure much has changed of course we have you know legislation which makes it uh, mandatory for corporate houses to have um you know uh, infrastructure or systems in place to make sure that women are not harassed or women are not uh, um molested or any of those yeah. things you Exploited, know happening yeah. there but yeah. i am not sure we have changed our mindset you know so there are women there are women in my first book in my third book where every time i've written about women and their journeys across whatever walks of life mm. uh, there is there is this wonderful woman uh, called manisha girotra she is you know the the boss boss woman at uh, molis bank and mm-hmm. uh, she london's uh, uh, um she, she she her first job was in london uh, in a multinational bank and she says that uh, not my gold medal not my various degrees none of those mattered at my first job in london i had two different job profiles one was to do the banking role that i was expected to do but even more was the being the uh, coffee bringer for my boss mm. and she said any time there was a boys meeting or any time there was a meeting happening in the in the office i was the one who was expected to bring the pizza for everybody so the that has not changed yeah. even today the only right. difference is that now because of social media and because of 
all of this said sort of how people are using technology these stories come out you mm. know but i often wonder whether how many women actually dare to use this uh, well uh, you know instagram and twitter make us believe that every woman can take to t- twitter and uh, you know tell the world about what's happening with her it's not that you know mm. i think twitter and all of that is for a very limited percentage of people the rest of us are all um, well i would i would not go to twitter but i would know how to look after myself but i don't think a lot of women are there yet you know i don't know how many of us are really in a position to say i don't need this job and you know i mm-hmm. most women will put up with it uh, some way or the other make adjustments or move away from there but calling out a person is a very very difficult thing so i'm not sure how much has changed also the mindset like mm. we have to change our mindset before me too or social media uh, does not mean that we have changed our mindsets if you look at twitter for instance have you seen the filth that happens there you know every time a woman expresses her mind it's disgusting have you seen yeah. the filth that is thrown at her yeah yeah So, and I want so, to just quickly in, in, interrupt. Sorry, Sudha. I just want to ask you. You know, this is something which I, I've been thinking about, and sort of plays into what you just said. Is is it almost like we are living with two different realities or two different illusions? It's are. almost like you feel like, oh, I've expressed my grievance on the internet, and everyone either celebrates me or trolls yeah. me, and as you said, the filth that's thrown. And then you come to reality or another illusion, which is the physical world. Like yeah. you know, you celebrated with the right hashtags or overcome disability adversity, and then yeah, yeah. you are unable you to cross the damn road. Life, yeah. You can't even cross the road, right? So, as you said, you can quit your job because you have your support, you have your close friends, yeah. you have people you can trust physically, not yeah. the thousand people who follow you on Twitter who will say, yeah. "I'll scream if Sudha's book doesn't get published," which is yeah. rubbish, <laughs> right? In some sense, which yeah. is. what is the reality so i just want yeah. you to maybe sort of include that because i feel more of that people who you know oh it's it's a, it's a huge hoo ha on the internet it's gone viral and then you wake up the next morning there's another thing which has gone viral and your topics moved on and reality yeah. remains the same right yeah i think we are all living in a, some some sort of delusional world mm. and i too am part of this because yeah. I mean so I my of course we morning. can't yeah yeah i wake up in the morning and i feel that i must post something Mm. and then there is so much pressure to post something you know content mm. and pictures and videos and sometimes i sit back and i'm i'm the chief caretaker for my ch- chief caregiver for my mother who has dementia just now and okay. now my world has suddenly changed because now it is not what i post on instagram it is whether i'm able to look after my mother well whether i'm able to keep her safe and secure and whether i'm able to keep myself in reason in a reasonably sane kind of frame yeah, of yeah. mind yeah. after dealing with somebody who's clearly not you know uh, in the best of health very yeah. very poor health mental yeah. health so we all i think are living in this sort of two realities kind of zone it puts immense pressure on your mental health on your yeah. well being yeah and um, very often very often i have thought i would quit but it's like an addiction like yeah. i think the, the maybe the 70s and the 80s were where you actually did physical drugs to trip up but yeah. now this is the this is a new high that everybody wants they all want to be influencers they all want to be uh, you know the social on social media they all want to be uh, seen yeah. and heard and you know it's almost like a sense of that if you I mean I I am not at all popular or famous or anything on social media I've had nothing you know I I'm not a comedian whose videos go viral I'm not anyone yeah. who gets recognized none of that it's not no. worked for me and I'm not um want to say oh it's the worst thing for that reason because you know it's 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 helped so many people it's helped people yeah. unite it's also helped people make a career and get out of a trap they pr- probably wouldn't have gotten out of like maybe from a town which they felt very claustrophobic in or yeah. from a family situation where they said you know you have to be an engineer or a doctor many kids have got the internet and youtube to thank for that saying you know what yeah, i'm a youtuber yeah, now yeah. which is so there great. is there are great pluses Sorry. to it but yeah. equally there are great negatives to it so and i think you, more and more the negatives are what scare me because it almost feels like it, with what you spoken about whether it's women safety women's rights and it's about equality or equity or equal access or disability it's it's almost like with the vastness of the internet and the potential reach that it has it almost feels like it acts on itself and creates an echo chamber which becomes smaller and smaller 
yeah and that's the problem and sometimes i find myself uh, sometimes i find myself rationalizing with myself i i would yeah. be scrolling and i just you know i get 5 minutes i scroll and and suddenly i look up and it's been one hour and I, yeah. so i've just squandered away one hour of my time yeah just looking at posts which mean nothing to me it is not going to impact me in any way it's not going to better my life in any way but i'm still doing that and somebody told me the other day and i don't know how much of it is true but i think partly true that uh, we are going to become a nation of zombies soon our children are not reading our children are not going out and play because yeah. everybody is hooked onto their phones and yeah. it's not a good thing now in, in fact spoke to a, a, a lady from australia a couple of episodes back in uh, lailstone right and she was talking she's a child development therapist and she talks about emotional maturity in children and how to raise more emotionally uh, a children Resilient with more emotional children. emotional maturity and well-being yeah. uh, wellness right and she was talking about this exactly and we we had this point about how the mind is something which is so difficult for us to befriend and to kind of use in a friendly way and not let take over our lives and now yeah. we have the phone that takes over our mind and the mind is anyway so vulnerable and it's almost like the mind is under attack from all sides right and what yeah. gives the mind resilience going out community connection being with people who care about you for, forging those things that the tribe needed which is a sense of camaraderie being together now we're encouraging activities that promote more isolation you're on your yeah. phone you're getting all this validation from people who you really don't know people who are putting you down and it's absolutely what you just said it's reaffirming that belief that you are so alone yet so connected uh, you yeah. seemingly so you you I, walk yeah. into a room where there are five youngsters and they're all yeah. uh, they're all supposed to be on a, uh, at a sleepover or something and yeah. if you walk into a room where these um, teenagers are having a sleepover they're all there and they're all on their phones they're just yeah. sitting in the same room yeah. you know while even 10 15 years ago it was different you got together you hung out together and there was so much conversation and it was yeah. so much exchange of information and just fun maybe maybe their idea of fun is this but i think somewhere you're losing the plot and i'm yeah. i'm i'm guilty of being there also as well. i mean we all are right we can't live in isolation i mean in that another level of isolation like <laughs> reject everything because then you kind of have to assimilate into yeah. society but where finding do you the than... balance is the key yeah. which which clearly nobody is finding no i think because see as an author as a journalist as someone who uses words as a medium of communication and building imagination and building these stories you want to communicate you you of course will tell someone who's an aspiring writer it's not easy you have to find your style you have to find your you have to find a way to express your stories in the most authentic and honest way it's yeah. a long process but it's a process that you can spend your entire life doing and you take pleasure in small little wins right oh i discovered a better way a better style of yes. writing i found this character has so much more life in him or her or in whatever the the the, the plot how it shapes out but these are things that take time they take a yeah. uh, one step forward one step back or two steps back like no story comes out in your sleep and the next morning it's gone viral right but we have this sense <laughs> i mean you probably can explain that it's a difficult process and even it similarly is, in my know, like uh, yeah now I'm just I, the point i'm making is like now with this instant satisfaction kids want to be the next elon musk they want to be the next jk rowling they want to yeah. be the next sudha menon but they don't know the process uh, of rejection the process yes. of introspection the process of discovery the process of fine tuning or the process of even Im imagination right because yeah. it's almost like with all these filters with these things replication is rewarded quicker than uniqueness or authenticity yeah. or uh, originality right uh, mediocrity is rewarded more than something truly which is you which takes time to develop but if you can dance like drake on the next video it's amazing I, i'm yeah. saying not everyone but it seems to be more and more of the 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 theme and the trend right yeah yeah it's it's i think the era of instant gratification and it has pervaded every aspect of our life so in yeah. 2010 when i launched my first book leading ladies yeah. uh, you know there was this book tour thing in those days there used to be book tours so you went to different corners of the country and you launch, you know promoted your book in book shop book stores and wherever there are book clubs yeah. and all of that and everywhere i went there would be somebody or the other at these gatherings who would say man you've written so well and you know what i have this story that i want to write but i don't know how to write and yeah. you know when this had happened enough times i knew that there was a gap um, in the market i want to say but that would sound very kind of like a product that i was selling but there was this clear gap 
you know that people didn't know how to write like mm. uh, we were taught very boring writing in school in those days yeah. and it used to be like write a, write an essay about your summer visit to your grandmother yeah. or your annual trip to somewhere those are the kind of things we wrote and yeah, yeah, clearly yeah. there was no there was no concept of creative writing or any of that and so i started yeah. what was i think india's longest running writing workshop and i don't i don't promote it and i don't do a lot of those things most of my workshops but it, get writing is i think india's longest running uh, writing workshop series and i oh, conducted fantastic. across cities my my uh, intent was just this that i want to give wings to the writing aspirations of people yeah. and um, when i launched it in 2010 i did it with great fear in my mind because yeah. there was no concept like that and my friends told me you have a reputation as a journalist and as a writer of a very yeah. good book why do you want to risk this with starting something like this yeah, what yeah, if it yeah. doesn't take off you will have ruined your rep uh, reputation and i said no let me follow my instinct here yeah. and i followed my instinct and in a city like pune which in those days like yeah. 12 years ago Uh, was very conservative with spending yeah. money and all of that. Yeah, But forty-five yeah, yeah. people wrote with me that day. You know, it was oh, it lovely. was uh, uh, yeah. That first workshop I held in a five-star hotel. Forty-five people wrote with me. The oldest was eighty, and the youngest was eight. My God! And it was yeah. wonderful. Yeah, it was really, really wonderful. You know, and I was so fascinated by the stories. Yeah, uh, I had to send back twenty people or so because they, I didn't have space, and that mm. I never looked back. Uh, from there like it is it's been um, it has been one of the most fulfilling things i have done you know to allow somebody to help somebody to empower somebody to write their stories but what i have been finding over the last 4 or 5 years is that people come into the workshop it's a day long workshop and people keep coming back to it every time i hold uh, an edition uh, you know the workshopers come back to it there are workshopers who come and say uh, ma'am who do you think i should publish with is penguin okay or is hapa collins okay yeah. so i would say uh, well depends on what you have written so what have you written uh, nothing you know i just want to know what is the best publisher so accordingly i will write and i will tell Ouch. them that yeah. it doesn't work like that you have to create something that other people would want to write so yeah. worry about your writing first and worry about finding a publisher or who you will publish with it's not like that at all but Yeah. Now there is, you know, vanity public publishing has arrived, and so if you have the money, and even if your story is total BS, uh, it still gets published because you're you're paid that vanity publisher a few lakhs, and your book is there. Uh, Uh, oh, there's a thing where you can. No, it's it's such a weird thing, and I I, I told I, I told you when you spoke over the phone, I, I interviewed Meghna Pant, right, and she was telling me a similar thing that. First of all I think so many people apply to publishers there's such a high rate of rejection but still yeah. there are about thousands of books being published uh, thousands of authors being published every month and they don't yeah. even see uh, more than I don't know how many copies being being sold so it's yeah. it's almost like it, on the flip side where earlier it was access and being uh, discovered and mm. this thing was hard now it's almost like anyone can get published yeah so I'm saying I, but it's it's the wrong motivation as you said earlier the intention Absolutely. or the motivation was to tell a good story to yeah. to cover now it is certain, fame yeah yeah now it is fame like you can put it on instagram and twitter have your two more, you know moments uh, um in the sun and that's yeah. all you want like you'll be amazed how many how many parents i have to sort of like fight away because they will come to me and say um uh, my daughter wants to write a book and yeah. uh, you know we, we we can invest in it this is how it is now so it is rich right. parents investing in a 8 year old who wants to write a book and or in I the same thing where you tell them great. to play a studio for a music thing right like my my daughter can sing or my son can play the drums and you pay you pay the band to take them or something like that right yeah yeah, yeah. so i say you're doing a disservice to your child yeah. you know give the child time let let the child discover explore the world explore how he feels about various things and then the, what you're doing is providing instant gratification you put a substandard thing out in the world you uh, you put it out in the world with the power of your money and i said you're doing your child disservice you're lowering the benchmark for him you know and, and that's what we're seeing now right the message that i can use my money to get anywhere i want money uh, or whatever like um, to see that yeah the currency could be money it could be threats saying uh, to the school teacher saying if you give my son bad grades i'll uh, complain to the principal 
So as a result, you see a society of children who can't take rejection, who are mm-hmm. okay with, uh, who are always celebrated as, you know, someone was saying that whole thing, that there's no one in last place, right? Last, yeah, uh, everybody no, is to- a topper, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that creates a sickness. It creates this yeah. thing that, oh, you know what? It's not my fault. It's uh, someone else's problem that yeah. I, I'm perfect. And, yeah. and, you know, I want to talk about in, in leading from that point you just mentioned, um, you've interviewed some extremely uh, sort of impressive um, pe- people with some impressive stories from mm-hmm. leading ladies to the daughters of all these mm-hmm. uh, business mm-hmm. Mughals or whatever the um, their success is, right? I think you inter- mm-hmm. in Legacy, you interviewed mm-hmm. a lot of these uh, parents and children. Uh, say, and say to Gifted, uh, the various kinds of stories, again, of uh, overcoming adversity and living mm-hmm. a life. And while it seems very different and um, the, 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 the range of stories is quite diverse. Were there things that you discovered common to all these stories, uh, whether it's trait, uh, personality traits, whether it's motivations that drove people in all these three books, especially Absolutely. I'm talking. Yeah, can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah, uh, so, so of the six books that I have written in the last few years, Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I call myself a chronicler of people's stories. That's what mm-hmm. I do. You know, uh, I'm inspired usually by real life people. And not, so I, I'm all, I'm, my family always tells me, why don't you write fiction? And mm-hmm. I always say, you know, I want to write fiction, but there is so much in real life yeah. that I often feel, why should I create something? I want to tell the story of real people. I, everywhere I go, I see a story which needs to be told. Yeah. So yeah, so in all these books that I, I have, uh, it's always interviewing people and bringing those stories to fore. I think if you ask me what are the common traits, I think the most important trait that I've always seen in these uh, people is great self-belief. You know, I think if you have self-belief, if you believe in yourself, if you believe that you can get past all the circumstances that are keeping you down, um, then nobody can stop. So that that sense of self-worth I always tell, like, I, I'm also a speaker at, uh, you know, on uh, on leadership and success. Yeah. And uh, I do motivational talks at various, uh, on various platforms. And this, the single most important thing, thing I always tell uh, at my talk is that believe in your story. You know, when, if you be, believe in your story, then other people will believe in your, buy into that story. But your story begins with you and let nobody else tell you that this is not how it is meant. Mm. You know, so, so it's great self-belief, um, great determination, mm. never shying away from a hard work, ability to take failure in stride. I think far too many of us celebrate, you know, success, but yeah. the ability to take rejection, the ability to take failure in your stride is as important. Um, Somebody once told me, you know, one of these women that I interviewed in one of my books, a lady called Devita Sara, Mm. who, um, who's the boss woman at View Technologies, you know, the Mm. smart TVs. Um, She, uh, she once told me that uh, um, women always take, like she, she, she told me that if, if a workplace or a man or a set of circumstances don't work for you, don't think it or think about it as your failure. Mm. It is their problem. You move away, f- away from there and get to the right, get yourself the right working conditions or the right man or, the, or people who will buy into you. But if, she said that it is, it is important to learn about failure very early in life. If you're faced yeah. failure early, then it toughens you up for the rest of the journey. So that is very important. I think also it is very important to have a sense of who you want to be. It is no longer, you know, we live in a world where, um, and it sounds like a formula, but it is not a formula. I have practiced it on myself. You know, um, don't be stagnant. You know, be, be that person who can adapt. Be that person who is always pushing forward, moving forward. Yeah. And uh, that Rolling Stone gathers no uh, moss kind of thing. Yeah, so yeah. I have uh, all the people in the over the last 35 years of me interviewing people. If there is another common trait, it is that they are not 
they're not people who are content with just that much you know and i there are people who tell themselves every day that i can do more and i i i can do more and it is does not necessarily have to be from just me alone i want to do things that will impact other people's lives positively that is mm. that is very important you know giving back in some way and yeah. all of the people i have interviewed most of them have in some way or the other given back to society you know by helping somebody else i want to talk to you about uh, ila ila bhat uh, yeah. person who set up gandhian and yeah. she must be well into her 90s now but she wrote the forward for my book leading ladies my first book and oh, when i means. went okay. you know a oh, oh, petit uh, little woman you know frail mm. frail and when i met her she was well into her 70s 75 maybe mm. and um, she she set up what is today india's largest the world's largest trade union of people who work in the organized sector women mm. all women it's a mm. all women trade union body oh that's pretty for people pretty. for women who work in the organized sector and she mm. said i did that because i could not bear to see how women in the in amdabad textile mills you know they they were they were rag pickers and people who uh, moved goods around around yeah. they lived on the on the fringes of amdabad's thriving textile markets yeah and she said i wanted to help them i wanted to stop how badly they were being exploited yeah. and so she started with teaching them livelihood skills she got other like minded women she taught them embroidery she taught mm. them stitching and she taught them various skills which would allow them to earn a few pennies for themselves mm. instead of being you know dependent on their families right. and then when that was done then seva self employed women's association when when she initially gave them livelihood skills they started making some money and mm. then she started seva bank for them so the women started earning their money saving a little bit and nice. then she started the bank started lending to other women who wanted to also become entrepreneurs and slowly but surely you know she says when the when these women who live in very small villages in in the heartlands of india she said those women live in in societies where if she's in her in laws family they probably don't even know her name she's just the bahu and she lives with a veil over her head in the kitchen the journey from out of the kitchen into the living room and then out of the house to the bank where she got her first i card with her name on it My she God. says that was the beginning of their journey and they have never looked back today today seva provides banking insurance crash facilities housing loans everything that a woman needs to be self reliant that's pretty and you know yeah. and she said something that um, we started this thing but she said that you are here writing about women and inspiring other women she said if each of you women from uh, from urban centers spent a week from your life in a rural center helping another woman uh, empowering other women another woman in the rural center to start living her dream that is how you can truly empower women you know you all are already yeah. empowered see if you can reach out to another woman living in a village and teach her how, that she can to she too can actually live her dream that, that would be yeah. when change happens and i think that's what's not happening um as yeah. you know a male i shouldn't be speaking about this because i'll be cancelled <laughs> but <laughs> it's it's almost what that lady what what ila but right um, ila but she says is mind blowing that's the idea behind empowerment right is to use your situation to give someone else hope yeah but instead it i almost sense that what's happening now with the social media wave of social justice is if you are a woman the only way you can empower yourself is by putting down a man is male bashing <laughs> yes. it's you almost get that sense right yeah it's hmm. i i get asked this a lot of times that is feminism about male bashing and i always say no feminism about is about choice feminism hmm. about is about a lot of things but it's not about putting a man down not at all in fact uh, my father was the most fierce feminist i knew and he yeah. raised three daughters who are fiercely feminist and yeah. we we three sisters are raising our own kids to be very very fierce okay. feminists so it's not about male bashing at all i think men and women can work together to make this a more uh, equitable equal world yeah. so yeah and that message is lost in all this sort of 
playing uh and you said something about self belief which is such an important thing but it can also very easily turn into delusion right that i yeah, deserve absolutely. certain things <laughs> like everything else it is about balance yeah and if you've been if you have grown up the right, right way then yeah. you will know it instinctively what is delusional and what is just yeah but sadly a lot of people don't have a that huge sense of self uh what worth yeah no but sadly with this reinforcement happening on the internet with people you don't really know who are assuming or, or you assume are your close friends it's such a delicate uh, as you said yeah. it's a balance to start with balance. but it, it's the car- it's almost like every time you think you're someone or you think you uh, believe in yourself the carpet is pulled the rug is pulled under from under your feet yes. and you're just again grasping the straws Back to you know? one. Yeah. yeah also you know one of the things that i noticed and it is uh, it is scary a bit uh, in many ways it's scary but it is all this congratulatory messages that people send to each other on uh, instagram about congratulations on your 10k followers mm. and i'm like this is what we have come down to like yeah. you know how many likes you have got how many followers you got on instagram is what defines your worth and oh, that's yeah. really a sad state of affairs <laughs> <laughs> it's it's scary like yeah who are you when you're not on instagram what is someone hacks you your account shuts it down nobody is yeah. looking yeah yeah um, how do you deal with people how what is your equation with your mother what is your equation with your child uh, what is your equation with the community those are the things that matters what are you yeah. doing that helps another person and uh, you know those are the things that matter not that 10 uh, k followers are uh, you know uh, lauding you when you yeah. make yet another post but uh, i think sometimes i think that we are losing the plot <laughs> very fast speaking of plots uh you uh <laughs> see that segue <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no but now you finally made the the foray into fiction uh, i haven't you i haven't? keep telling myself i will write fiction but no uh, no you coming up with a new least, book now um my new book is this book called recipes for life and uh, it is uh, it is a book of uh, i started out you know writing recipes for life as a way of um, a, couple, a couple of years ago few years ago i lost okay. my um, mother in law you know brilliant cook brilliant brilliant cook she was a ckp and mm. the ckp community loves food Mm. and uh, sorry what so, ckp like if we wanted ever any good food it was my mother in law's house and what, what um, ckp I, i i don't know what ckp is uh, chandra seniya kayasta prabhu oh I, i okay yeah it's like saraswat brahmins right it is ckp is chandra seniya kayasta prabhu and the community mm. loves food like ah, okay. their entire life revolves around good food you okay. know and uh, she passed away from dementia Okay. and so over the last few years i just saw her losing her mind slowly bit by bit bit by bit and this woman who used to get her family and the community together um, around her dining table by the end of her life she didn't re- know the difference between sugar and salt okay you know that that was how it became and she went away and that summer that she went away um, i opened uh, my pickle ka uh, dabba and i saw there's no pickle there and then a few days later i wanted to make some khichdi and i look for every every year she would make all of those things and give it to the entire yeah. family and then the masala dabba was empty and slowly uh, we all the entire extended family we started noticing um, we started missing her because all those things all those goodies that she would distribute to us so organically we realized i realized that we had not none of us had the recipes for all those uh, you know heirloom recipes that had come down she said from her great mother in law to her great grandmother all of them had taught her what she had learned uh, all the goodies to make all those goodies and we didn't do- document any of those recipes nobody in the family we all assumed that she is going to be there and she would give us good food the last few years i have been seeing my mother losing her memory you know bit by bit bit by bit and now sometimes she's making sambar and suddenly you know she goes blank and she's forgotten so Ouch. two years ago in the middle of the pandemic i wrote this entire book in the middle of the pandemic in the yeah. first lockdown and uh, i decided that i would docu- i'd start documenting 
family recipes, recipes that had been in the families through generations. Oh, and such I, a brilliant I thing, believe yeah. that's a, such a brilliant I think that you know thing, through yeah. food, food is so much a part of our cultural uh, uh, identity. And yeah. if we don't document the things that we eat, uh, the things, the recipes that have been in our families for generations together, we will, we will, it will not be long before we have lost one important part of our cultural identity. So it no, started as a family journey. My sister's but 40th birthday, then, my wife did that, you know, instead of a fancy 40th birthday gift, she documented like the 10 favorite dishes my mom makes. And wow. she had the recipes with that. So that's why you just said it. I said it's such a brilliant thing because we were just yeah. talking about that the other day because my mom makes so many things, right? For everything, as you said, from pickle to sweets mm. or this vada at home or whether yeah. it's dosa in the morning with that right mango chutney yeah. or the, so we, we're from South Canada. So those dishes, right? But you don't yes. get it typically in Bangalore or at an Udupi restaurant, like typically it's dosa, sambar and very yeah. different. Even the sambar, there are four types of sambar. And yes, absolutely. Like, yeah, coconut curries, we have three, four. Then we have the ones without coconut. So they're each got a yes. name. And yeah. it's just striking a chord. And I'm like, my wife does not to cook uh, yeah. any of those dishes. My yeah. sister does a couple. But I'm just yeah. like, what will happen? Th th does it mean, because sometimes you sit here going, oh, I can't, I'm so sick of home food. I'm going to swiggy something <laughs> like, you know, some dal from outside, the dal. Yeah. But then you realize like now as I, I'm going to be 40 this year, at the end of this uh -huh. year. And I'm just like, I want my child to grow to up. Know. Yeah, yeah. And know that this is food. It's not what is easily got, it's basically, yes, we all can eat a sandwich. We all can eat a burger. We all can eat um, North Indian thali. We all can eat a South yes. Indian thali. But what is your food? Yes. When you, when you belong that, to a certain exactly. food. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's amazing. That is part of who you are, you know, what you yeah. eat is what, of, what, what part of your identity, essentially. Mm. So when I started putting my mother's and my grandmother, my mother-in-law's recipes together, one day I said, but why should it be just about me? Let yeah. me be, make this a bigger story. Let me put a book together of different people talking to me about their anecdotes, their memories around food. What is it that their family ate? So suddenly mm. in the in, in that period in which we were locked down, some six months or three months or four, four months, whatever, uh, I interviewed 20 people, 25 people. Oh, and lovely. they, okay. uh, ranging from Uday Kotak, who's a chairperson of uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank, yeah. uh, to Mitali Raj, uh, India's uh, woman cricket captain at that point, um, to Irfan Pathan, the cricketer, to right. Amish Tripathi, the, um, you know, uh, mil million copy selling uh, author. Amish Tripathi, the Ravan guy, right? Uh, the author. Amish Tripathi. Uh, Isn't he the person who wrote uh, Ra yes, Sita? Yes, oh, mythology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. And so many people, uh, Vidya Balan talking to me about her mother's hmm. uh, dosai and the dosai podi. Yeah. You know, Tiska Chopra. So I, I have this brilliant book of people who, of all these people who just talk to me about the simple everyday food that their mothers or mm. sometimes even their fathers cooked for them. And yeah. these are recipes that are now heirloom recipes because they've been there for like over a hundred years, you know, yeah. the yeah. family has eaten that thing. And if you don't document them, those recipes are gone and a part of your childhood is gone, a part of your cultural uh, identity is gone. And, and you might not miss it in the sense you might say, I ate it, but your kid, their kids, I mean, they will not even know. Correct. Like, you know, it's it's amazing that you are bringing this up because, I mean, you told me about the new book, but I, I, I didn't realize its value and its impact because it's something yeah. I've been thinking about. And it's, you know, you go to someone's house nowadays, of course, there's abundance of food, right? You yeah. you want, if say you and I and 10 other people meet at a dinner party, it's very easy for you to say, you know, I'm, I'm non-vegetarian. I go, I'm vegan and we get 10 different dishes from 10 different restaurants. It's catered. Yeah. It's lovely. Everyone seems to be happy. But many times when I was growing up, your like, soul is have, not in it. Yeah, and you would have friends that you would remember by the food that they would serve or their mother would Absolutely. serve at home. Like, I'd yeah. be like, oh, Rowan's house, the biryani was good or the, the chocolate cake was good or someone else's house. And I feel we've lost that. And this is yeah. amazing that you're Absolutely. trying to restore you know, it because it's very Absolutely. You know, and when I started writing this book, it was about food. But yeah. as I started writing and as I started interviewing people for the book, I learned that food is actually just... Uh, a medium through which other things come into your life. Yeah. So I had this long conversations with Suhasini Mani Ratnam. Mm. Uh, it, she's she's also part of the book, and she she's she spoke to me about growing up in this little village, um, uh, and uh, how the extended family. So uh, 
the father the grandfather and the father were both lawyers and the yeah. mother and the mother and the grandmother were, were at home and she said we are very affluent we are very affluent family but we are brought up very conservatively yeah and um, she says to me that uh, despite the fact that we could afford the best food around she said we lived in a community which was very poor and so around us were very poor people so she said even for diwali Mm. my mother you know even if there is a festival my mother would not make a big hooha about it but yeah. instead what she would make was a moong ka kani you know moong ka paisam yeah. she said just the, the the aroma of that cooking would waft through the entire community all the houses and she says our door was always open mm. and my mother said that whoever came into the house that day you know when that paisam was cooking everybody got to drink that everybody got to enjoy it and she says that is how i learned about empathy and compassion and sharing your you know blessings with other people there is yeah. another story of uh, author amish tripathi said uh, to me yeah. that his mother they, they grew up in a uh, middle class family there was enough food but there was not excess of anything you know it was like uh, india of that times so there is not there is just enough for the family and uh, he said that his mother was uh, mother was equal, loving but equally she was a stern woman who believed in inculcating values in children so he said that one day my sister well, we, we were at we were eating lunch and my sister pushed away the plate or uh, lunch plate when uh, she saw kareli ki sabji uh, mm. on the plate and she he, he said mr Tri, uh, tripathi amish said to me that i saw her pushing away the plate so i also pushed away my plate and said we are not going to eat karela Uh, no we want something better and he said that my mother looked at us and said this is what i can afford and this is what you will eat hmm. because this is our circumstance so yeah. today this has been cooked you have to eat that and we refused so she said uh, suit yourself when they came back for dinner uh, the same plate came uh, you know to the table and so she he said we didn't eat we again said we are not going to eat and we went to bed hungry Yeah. He said breakfast the same plate came the same kareli ki sabji came and he yeah. said that when it had happened four times we realized that this is she means business and yeah. we quietly ate the kareli ki sabji and he says I am so glad now that she put us through that because now we know the mother was against you know wastage and the mother was teaching them to actually. Uh, adjust to whatever so now he says whatever life throws at me i'm able to take it in my stride she taught us about through food she taught us about all of these things to to avoid yeah. wastage to accept things in your stride and adjust to whatever circumstances are in your life and so many yeah. of these things you know so many mary coms you know mary coms mother mary com grew up in a really really poor household like yeah. really poor they lived in a small little house uh, in the hills in manipur and uh, she says that they were so poor they were landless laborers they worked in other people's uh, farms so that they could bring food on the table for the children and she says that my mother uh, grew vegetables in a tiny little kitchen garden just in the backyard of the kitchen was this little kitchen garden and she says that she grew all the things that we needed for the family but she says most of it got sold because they couldn't afford to consume everything yeah. but she said that my most my most cherished memories even today are of sitting cross legged on the kitchen floor the four of us you know the children the mother parents and mom would have made the most delicious meals with everything that she had grown by herself you know because mm. they couldn't buy the father would go to a nearby lake and catch some fish the mother mm. would use the uh, vegetables from the kitchen and she says even today i can afford anything that i want yeah. but those that those yeah. simple meals that my mother made with so much love is what i remember even now and she says that because i grew up like that i teach my i cook the same kind of things for my children and they love that food the local yeah. you know that food yeah. that is part of our legacy so That's i think brilliant. that the yeah. book was written for that so that we preserve this little bit and like because i am on your show and because people listen to it i just want to say that if each of us like your wife has done if each of us decide today that we will document the things that we eat at home that take down those recipes store them somewhere properly then i think we'll never lose uh, 
our cultural identity because yeah. food also defines who we are it's important that we do that and it's and it's nice that you mentioned that food is a medium because you know it also reflects like now with so many food delivery options i remember um when there was a lot of and even with what you said amish told you there would there would be days that dishes were really boring right like you'd yeah. get a vegetable which is really dull or the preparation was really dull or it was yeah. a repeat thing like and you would be like throw a tantrum i can't eat this i want a pizza i want a burger and when i was growing up options were limited i mean not yeah. like we were deprived by any way but uh -huh. we didn't have the home delivery as often yeah but it made and and it made us value what we have Uh, yes, in, maybe maybe not in that moment, but now. <laughs> but I feel now like sometimes because there's home food, you think of an option from outside. But you eat like for four meals or three meals, like what you said, Amish and his sister to go through. Huh. But if he had gotten all of those because he could swiggy it, you lose the appreciation of how uh, it is because things from outside taste good because it's in contrast to something yes. or things at home day but then you realize now it's almost made me feel like i'm like yeah you know what i'm going to swiggy so some weekends i just maybe two meals or three meals i'm swiggy by monday i'm sick of it i'm just like you yeah, know you want to eat your home ka dosa or sambar yeah. or whatever you know and, and, and that's it. what you're missing and you're making yes. uh with every meal if you get your way that resilience goes and i i don't yeah. want to call it resilience alone but you just sort of become you 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 it's almost like there's nothing in yeah. your way to challenge your way of thinking it's almost like you're being spoiled and that's yeah. not good i had this you know um, my daughter is a chef mm. and i remember a few years ago uh, she went to london to look at the blood to study mm. pastry nice. and she wanted to be a pastry chef and so when she was going from here i told her you know this is a, this is sambar masala and this is something something and whatever yes. and i said i'll give you a small cooker so that occasionally you can make some rice and something and eat and she looked at me and said mom from the time i leave from this airport till the time i come back i'm never going to eat any south indian food or any indian food because i'm sick and tired of eating it i'm only going to eat uh, pasta and burgers famous and last words <laughs> yeah 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 so exactly 15 days after yeah. she reached there i got my first call mama how do you make sambar <laughs> <laughs> I said, but I thought that you're not going to eat in she the said, famous no, Accord Blanc. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. By the time she came back, yeah, like six months into her uh, stay in London, she was ordering stuff like tonli. You know, tonli is something I don't know what it's called in. Uh, you're talking about the English, vegetable. I forget the name. Ah, uh, but the the tendi, right? The the. Da tendi, yeah. Right, right, right. She was ordering that at some six pounds for a pound. <laughs> for pau kilo or something and right. she was making that and i said you know so when you speak you have to be very careful what yeah. you say now yeah. you're eating tenly plus your words so, yeah absolutely it, so, it yeah. doesn't go down too well especially when it's with your words <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh my god no i i i i totally um, appreciate what you've done with this because it's something that um It's it's so interesting that you bring it up and uh, your book is sort of this. I've just been thinking about it and I, I'm just like it's such it's not just the food. It's it's the like when my grandma was alive, it was always Sundays. Her daughters or my dad's sisters would come, and yeah, there was food. Uh, but it yeah. wasn't like one person say, "I want this dish. I I'm no. vegan. I'm the, whatever there was. We all ate. Of course, some yeah, favorites were made. Yeah, it was a community experience. Like, yeah, but and we all ate what was there. Exactly. We would eat. Obviously, some favorites would be made again and again. And yeah, yeah. But it was more of a celebration of the fa fact that we're coming together. And Absolutely. I I yeah. want to just sort of before we wind up, ask you a couple of things. And if it's too personal, please feel free not to answer it. But. Mm -hmm. you witnessed your mother in law go through the decline into dementia and you said your mm. mother's having a time mm. of dealing with it and you've also spoken to so many people from gifted where some of the people you featured are no more to mm. uh, people in your earlier books and of course from leading ladies to uh, legacy to gifted mm. to now recipes to life mm. uh, res is it recipes to life recipes of life sorry recipes for life recipes yeah. for life sorry and seeing the personal example of your mother in law and now your mother living with dementia what is it taught you about yourself that that no that no matter how much you think you're important and no matter how much in control of your life you think you are hmm. i have now slowly but very surely come to know that uh, we are just but a speck in this universe 
and the sooner we learn to handle that that you are here life is very transient very very transient so you are here very momentarily you know so um, make your stay on this earth matter you know do something for not just yourself but do it for somebody else um, also it's the sooner you learn that you are not the most important person in the room the better mm. for you because uh, look at us like the entire universe like all over the world all of us brought down to our knees by a virus that we still haven't cracked yeah what does that teach you about your you know what does that do to your ego what does that do to your best selling books or you know million dollar grossing movies nothing we are yeah. all locked up in our house shivering yeah. and washing vegetable before eating it so i think we have to take and lucky if we have a house yeah, yeah. yes we are lucky to have a house and yeah. a life you know yeah. so many people just went away because because of a virus that we we haven't seen and we haven't cracked yet not defeated it yet so i think all of those books that i've written and all my years uh, in this universe has taught me that one thing that don't take yourself too too seriously you know it just takes a moment and a small virus and you're done so it, th- even though it sounds like the death knell and very pessimistic but it is important that i think it is it is necessary that we learn that we are not the most powerful people uh, roaming around on this earth and those words have so much more weightage when coming from someone who's lived such a long life uh, of experiences and also <laughs> and i mean you've come across so many different people in depth uh, got to know them in depth and you've yeah. written such an amazing book like gifted because i'm in it and uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> had to plug that in. no but it's brilliant um, sada frankly um, i think what you've done i when we spoke the way i i knew it was you know not just a marketing gimmick you know because yeah. you can t- you can sense that when the intention that you mentioned is so clear and so it's so Uh, I'm so glad that it's reached so many people. All your books, yeah. and um, you know, I think um, it's it's amazing that you continue to do this. And I hope the day that you write fiction is also yes, uh, I hope so. that will be. I think everybody asks, what is the biggest challenge in your life just now? And I always say my biggest challenge is to sit down and finish that fiction work mm. that has been staring at me from my cupboard for the last, I think, now ten years or something. I'll I, narrate I, it for I, you. I always say my next version. work is going to be fiction, but. inevitably i think of an idea which is non fiction and it like compels me to write it and so yeah. my fiction gets so yeah <laughs> one no, of these days it'll it I, i eagerly await it and i uh, i'll uh, narrate it for you audio book guys <laughs> okay oh lovely <laughs> I, don't, i don't know how i'll read it but <laughs> maybe i'll just make up a <laughs> different story i will read it to you <laughs> <laughs> that'll be the longest audio book recording you read out the lines yes. i read it out again <laughs> no you should read your own book i think that will be brilliant I think that'd be fantastic. But rest Thank peaceful you. life. It has been wonderful talking to you, Sandeep. And as always, you so that like. And where is the book? Is it on? Uh, is it already out on the shelves? It's 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 every it's on Amazon. It's all in all the bookstores and all the online stores. So no, lovely. The book is going to be a great read and also help people uh, sort of open their. Let me show you. Oh no, I don't have it just now to show to show it to you. But it's called Recipes for Life. Fantastic. And it's published by Penguin. Lovely. No, and it's great that the book can also open people's. Uh, Calgary it is also on Horizon. Spotify and all of that. There is an audio book already out. Oh, it's already out. Okay, that's fa- even better uh, for people yeah. listening right now, so they can just click on it after yeah. listening to this episode. I don't yes. have to go anywhere right now, uh, <laughs> but uh, I know it because it's also the experience of these stories which you just said about uh, yes. Vidya Balan and her mother's relationship with her. And, but yes. at the same time, they can try the food out, right? They Absolutely. Can so many people are doing that, and you know, one of the stories in the book, uh, Sandeep, that I. It, that's very very special for me is my like it was an amazing chance to interview amir khan's mother mm. now she is the most low profile gentle lady that i have ever known she like yeah. she might be a superstar's mother but she is just her own person very confident in herself very quiet very uh, you know not the one, not one of those bollywood moms who are there everywhere and uh, i met ami zinat zinat uh, her name is zinat uh, zinat husain and i met her and um, what was supposed to be maybe a half an hour conversation turned out to be like a 3 hour mm-hmm. uh, conversation and more than once and it was fascinating to listen to her story of how she grew up uh, you know at two she lost her parents 
and sure. um, she and her sister and she was actually raised by her uh, paternal aunt and uh, in banaras mm. and how she grew up in banaras under the you know loving uh, gaze of her uh, paternal aunt and how she learned the intricacies of banarasi cooking mm. you know and she learned all the shawarmas and biryanis and the kebabs and all of wow. that and uh, how eventually she came to bombay then got married to you know um, tahir hussain who was uh, her, you know the, the children her husband who, and how she pulled the entire family together just by uh, the food she cooked she said everybody in the family she says my mother in law became my fan that first day that i cooked for her <laughs> nice you know and she says she was always like even when she, she lived with the uh, with the, the mother in law lived with the another son yeah. but the food for her mother in law went from uh, uh, you know zina tamis house because right. she loved her kind of banarasi cooking and That's for crazy. me it was not just the recipes it was through zina tusen's uh, narration of her life of her life in banaras and how they came to bombay then briefly shifted to pakistan because mm. the rest of the family was there and how they didn't like it there so they came back to bombay and mm. then she got married i got to look at india's evolution i got to look at india's history yeah and how food became how the food from banaras became what it was just through a, a single woman narration of her own story yeah and then she told me uh, i asked her what is uh, what is what are the things that your family likes that you make so she says um, you know and i asked her what is your children's favorite and she said amir mia ka favorite halwa is a be- simple besan ka halwa that she makes and he, and she says that that is his go to food four o'clock craving to ammi's besan ka halwa and she says that now i'm old and frail and so i've taught his uh, you know uh, cook to make it and i supervise it when uh, she's making it and it's stored in the fridge and because i supervised it it tastes like my halwa so but amir has no idea that it's the maid who has made it <laughs> because he insists that i make it for him nice. so it is you know so many things you learn gives you insight into a person to from her yeah. to her son to her husband to her family it's, it's lovely so much yeah no like right now as we speak my mouth what my dad i think is making some aloo bonda and i'm just like dude <laughs> i told him can you not cook during my recordings because the smell comes into the room and it's just such a then you're distracted <laughs> distracted <laughs> because for me as an author i'm sure you have um you've come across this but also you'd like to sort of put this in your books because you know when i remember when i was young i think my mom would read out the uh, asterix comics right huh. and in that obelix would love eating the wild boar and yeah. i remember once going to mysore with my uncle and my mom and all of us and i think we were at the, this some hotel i forget i think the metropole or something and the, the, the everyone's placing an order for lunch and they asked me what would you want to eat and i said wild boar and my uncle like what <laughs> you don't have wild boar because <laughs> it's it's also like reading in it blight and famous five you know they'd make those ham sandwiches and those yes, jam yes. and and my mom's like i told my mom and i want to eat tongue and she's like dude that's only the book we're not going to get tongue you know <laughs> then it's just that it's so powerful like even the banquets in the these imagery banquets. is so powerful it's yeah. amazing and the in your book in this particular book people can actually bring that to life it's it's yes. fantastic yes you know there is there is this vidya valan talking to me about of course her mother's food but he but she said that if amma didn't make any dessert on a sunday we would never be disappointed because then appa would immediately get to the kitchen and make nendra pala noruka i don't know whether yeah. you know nendra pala that's the that planted banana The big banana, yellow banana yeah. from Kerala. Yeah, so we make it at home. We make it with we fry it in ghee and put sugar on top. Is that the one? Yes, uh, jaggery. Oh, yeah, jaggery. It's delicious. So he, yeah, her her father would make it for her. Yeah. And so then, we have a similar thing now. Dad's retired, so mum cooks uh, during the day. She cleans uh-huh. everything, and she she's my mum's bit of a neat freak, right? She wants the kitchen <laughs> to be spotless. And the moment the yeah, last yeah. Gr- the last sort of little uh, bit of grease is taken off. My dad starts cooking, and my mom's like, "Oh God, my kitchen!" <laughs> it's, so we have a day shift and a night shift, so depending. Yeah. And my dad loves making all these rich North Indian dishes. And uh, yeah. during the lockdown, we were experimented on. And then at one point, Nivi, my uh, mom, and I got COVID. So for seven days, dad was feeding us. So one day it was saffron rice with this. Then oh. we we're like, "Oh then, my God!" <laughs> and towards day four, we all lost our sense of taste. So it was like great food, great food. <laughs> So yeah, I, he doesn't listen to this podcast, so he should be fine. 
<laughs> I'm so glad you've done this book, uh, so that I'm sure it's, it's come out beautifully because your style of writing is lovely. It's uh, it's so great uh, that you continue to do this and. Thanks for coming on the podcast and agreeing to talk to me. Thank you very, very much. And I'm looking forward to listening to this. And you have a good day, Sanjeev. And Bye-bye. you, Sudha. Take care. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye.